We're joined by a gentleman who has great background in the issues related to terror. Kyle Scheidler is the director of the Threat Information Office at the Center for Security Policy. Mr. Scheidler, thanks for being with us. How are you? Uh, thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, great to have you. What What is the Threat Information Office? Well, we're an open source research and analysis wing for the Center for Security Policy. So that means we do a lot of uh, tracking uh, suspected uh, Islamic groups, uh, Islamist groups, jihadist groups uh, on social media uh, and on the web. Let me ask you very simply to start with in terms of threats. If the Passaic, New Jersey Home Depot had this guy come in, and we've seen his pictures, so he looks, and obviously we're not supposed to judge people by how they look, but he's got an, an Islamic name. He's got uh, His first name actually means um, something about the sword of Allah, so his parents um, maybe were of this background to begin with. But if they had said, no, we're not going to rent you the vehicle, we're not comfortable doing it, you and I both know they would have been sued, they would have been pilloried, pummeled, CNN would have been all over him, NBC, ABC, CBS, and then he becomes the guy who winds up killing eight people. If we're going to have that level of political correctness, how are we ever going to solve this problem? Yeah, well, you mentioned two really good points, and, and the first, of course, is the man's appearance, highly Sharia compliant, and there was a study done by uh, on perspectives on terrorism which pointed out that in uh, cases of, for example, mosques, uh, that display highly Sharia-compliant behavior, you had a very high correlation, almost 80% correlation, with uh, the use of uh, violence-prone texts, uh, violence-prone Islamic doctrine, doctrinal texts. So there is something here. Now, just because an uh, individual chooses to appear in a certain way, does that necessarily mean that they will engage in specific behavior? No, it doesn't, but it's one of a series of indicators that one can begin to look for if one knows what one's looking for. Now, to the Home Depot question, you're exactly right. Uh, the NYPD pointed out, of course, that they had been in contact with uh, Home Depots and U-Haul uh, trucks and, and rider trucks and similar companies that sell and rent trucks because of the nature of this vehicular threat up in the uh, days leading up to this attack. But, of course, uh, if people do not feel that they have the ability to uh, either deny access or deny a sale in cases where they're concerned or suspicious or they don't feel comfortable uh, reaching out to police because of political correctness or because of this impression that they will be uh, judged or sued or otherwise uh, slandered uh, if they make a judgment that perhaps they're not comfortable selling this man a truck or renting this man a truck or selling this man a firearm or, or what have you. Uh, that's really that's really dangerous. Uh, Americans need to understand that uh, we are we have to rely on our own situational awareness and our own judgment about uh, threats that we face. And if we think there's a problem, we should call law enforcement. If we think there's a problem, we should deny a sale. Uh, if it's something like this where there's a potential threat. You know the problem though, Kyle, is that um, I had to laugh today when the Blasio of all people said. If you see something, say something. But he'd be the first guy to say you're Islamophobic if you suggest, if the Home Depot called him and said, uh, you know, or called the New York police and said, this guy just rented a truck and he looks suspicious, uh, de Blasio would have been all over those people. So they say, if you see something, say something. But then when you do that, then they come down on you. Well, as a matter of fact, the NYPD intelligence unit can no longer see things and say things because of Mayor de Blasio. You know, the NYPD intelligence program was really the envy of the entire country uh, when they ran afoul of certain Islamist organizations and leftist groups like the ACLU who sued them. Now, the NYPD defended their program in court, and they were defending it very successfully, pointing out that they were targeting uh, Islamic groups and um, certain mosques only because uh, of the, the evidence that they had, not because of any sort of blanket surveillance. And they were winning in court when de Blasio uh, came in as mayor and essentially forced them to settle that case. So 
the, the reality is that this individual uh, in this attack is reported to have attended a mosque from New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, which was one of the mosques that was part of this NYPD surveillance program. And that surveillance program was killed, and it was killed uh, largely because of folks like Mayor de Blasio. Yeah, and so I go back to my point. Uh, I'll just make it as a statement. This country does not have the will. And I'm not talking about the president now. He's, he's doing many of the right things, and I commend him. But I'm talking about overall, uh, especially New York, which is very vulnerable. Uh, Boston, same thing. The mosque where the Sarnayev brothers went to, the police had instructions not to go anywhere near the mosques, leave them alone, uh, let people pray as they see fit, all of that. Um, and they got radicalized, in part at least, at that mosque. This fellow may have gotten, well, I had Claire Lopez on earlier from your organization. She doesn't like talking about people being radicalized because they're born with it. I mean, they're indoctrinated with it by their parents. So um, whether whether somebody comes later to uh, Islamic Jihad or whether they are there from the get-go, either way, uh, you've got a situation where you don't have the national will to do what needs to be done here. Well, you know, the, the NYPD deputy commissioner at the press conference today said something. He was like, this is not about uh, Islam, and it's not about the mosque that this individual attended. Well, in fact, it may very well be about that. We don't know that for a fact yet because we haven't finished the investigation. Right. But the reality is that not all mosques are created equal, and there are some uh, in this country, for example, uh, like the Boston Mosque that you referenced, that were founded by men who are in prison for funding al-Qaeda and who have produced over a dozen people with ties to terrorism. That is a different case than some other uh, organization or some other mosque that may not have that track record. But these, these are track records that can be uh, understood and individuals whose connections can be tracked. These, this is real police work. This is real intelligence work. It's not just bias, right? And this notion that it's simply bias just because it happens to approach uh, a mosque or an organization that identifies itself as Islamic is uh, a sort of political correctness that gets people killed. Well, you're right. but you know, and, and we also know that he had uh, something written in the truck that said ISIS endures forever. Uh, we know that he uh, pledged his support to ISIS. Uh, and yet, what happens? The governor of New York still shows either his political correctness or his ignorance by saying that he was a lone wolf. This guy was not a lone wolf. He was part of a large international 30-country operation being spearheaded by ISIS and Al Adnigni, or Adnigni, uh, the one of the high guys at ISIS, put out edicts over the last couple of years saying that, you know, go after people with bricks and hit them over the head and break their skull or stab them with knives. Uh, in other words, changing the tune of things and the tone of things. Or uh, get a truck, he even said in, in that edict, get a truck and run over people, and that's what they've been doing in Europe and now here. So when this guy, Cuomo, says he's a lone wolf, would you agree with that? No, it, and that shows you exactly the kind of mentality that we see from some of these politicians where they want to run out and minimize the situation, you know, even before the investigation is done. The FBI and the NYPD just put out a bulletin looking for an individual uh, uh, as a person of interest in this case. Uh, and there are witness reports that, that this attacker was known to travel with a, a number of other individuals. And in 2015, this individual was, uh, this attacker was interviewed by counterterrorism officials because of his association with other individuals. So there's good reason to believe he's not a lone wolf at all. And as you pointed out, of course, that it's how is one a lone wolf? If one is a mem is a is a is a organ you know an organization gave a call and an express order to do an attack in a particular way and you followed that order, that's not a lone wolf. That's command and control. Someone said do something and you did it. Yeah, and and that, that's but see I, then Kyle, I go back to the same point. Uh, there are people in this country who have the will to do what needs to be done. There are other people in positions of power who do not. Uh, you've got the Democrats and you have, frankly, some Republicans in the Congress who um, would, would let this thing go. Uh, look, it's a different subject, but it's, it's the same thing as the left saying, well, I guess we have to live with North Korea having nuclear weapons. Well, wait a minute. 
they've, they've slowly encroached up to that point over two and a half decades. And now you want to say, well, since we did nothing before, which because you didn't want to do it, now Bill Clinton or Barack Obama didn't want to do it, and George Bush couldn't get anything done. So now uh, we're supposed to just let them have the weapons because we didn't do anything then because you told us not to. Uh, it, it's like you can't do the thing to prevent the problem, and then when the problem happens, uh, we just have to live with it. That's what it sounds like. That is pretty much what they're telling you in, in a lot of cases. That's exactly right. This is, you know, these, uh, they don't like uh, the intelligence. They don't like the surveillance efforts. Uh, they are very opposed to, for example, uh, the sort of sting operations where the FBI is able to take some of these individuals that they suspect uh, of terrorist affiliation and, and, and give them an opportunity and then arrest them before they can hurt anyone. Uh, they oppose all of these counterterrorism methods. And yet when uh, an attack occurs, they say, well, what could be done? He was a lone wolf. Nobody had any idea. Well, you know what? Claire was on this show earlier, as I mentioned, Claire Lopez. And she enumerated, and you no doubt have the same information, she enumerated uh, the background of this guy, that he was in a radical mosque in Ohio, that he was, uh, when he was born, his parents gave him the name that I mentioned to you. His first name means the sword of Allah, that he uh, clearly... Uh, was raised with this and then came to the country and there were indicators like uh, the, the, what, he, what happened in Ohio uh, of, of his nature. Um, you deal with threats. He's a threat. He wound up killing eight people. Uh, what, in your view, were there steps we could have taken or systems we could have followed or lo- looking on, uh, uh, online at his behavior, you know, however we do it, to get to a guy like this? Could we have done that? Well, I think he's an example of a classic known wolf, as my friend and fellow counterterrorism analyst Pat Poole calls him, which is he had contact with law enforcement. They had interviewed him before, and yet signs were missed. And so if we have the op- if they pop up on the radar, guys like this pop up on the radar, and they have interactions with law enforcement, clearly there was an opportunity there, and it was missed. Now, that's you know, that's always going to happen sometimes, but it's happening at a level that's completely unacceptable. And that tells me that we have a problem with our, either our training or our law enforcement tactics and procedures. Because if you're, if you're getting an opportunity to meet these guys, interview these guys, and figure out what they're all about, and you're not catching them, that's a problem. Well, uh, do you have hope? That we're going to get on the right. The president's on the right. But would you agree the president, in large measure at least, is on the right path? I think the president came into office on the right track. He, on the campaign trail, he, he clearly seemed to understand that this was an issue. Uh, it was an important issue, and it resonated with voters. Uh, and voters concerned about this issue largely flocked to President Trump. Since he's been in office, we've seen uh, not as much movement on this as we would have liked. Uh, the travel ban, as it's being described, uh, was kind of a step back from some of his rhetoric uh, before. We haven't seen a designation on the, on the Muslim Brotherhood that we might uh, prefer to see, and if which we had, we would be able to do a lot more targeting these sort of indoctrination and recruiting and terrorism finance uh, guys and try to cut down on, on this number of, of, uh, of attackers. Right Kyle, now, the FBI you... is looking at 1,000 ISIS cases. Yeah, uh, 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 they are, and Comey even admitted that. We'll come right back, and we'll wrap it up. I appreciate you taking the time. Kyle Scheidler is here. He deals with terror uh, threats, the Terror Information Desk at the Center for Security Policy.